And as part of the COP28 meetings, travel sector firms that signed an agreement a few years back to accelerate climate action will showcase just how they are working to be part of the solution. More destinations have been turning to sustainable measures to manage the impact of travel on the planet and on people. Well, CNA's Don Tan is exploring these issues for us in a multi-part series, looking at how tourism is under pressure to transform. Time away from home that leaves little trace. Travel almost everywhere has boomed, but there is a darker side to the problem of plenty. I think we need to be concerned. It's real, it, it will have an impact, and it's also a sign of potentially things to come in the future if no active interventions are being put into place to stop it. The impact of overtourism is being felt across Asia. One study showed Thailand's biggest island, Phuket, hosts 118 tourists for every one local resident. Other sought-after destinations in Asia have taken tough measures to deal with the downsides of mass tourism, from closures of popular beaches in the Philippines to tackling crowding at iconic sites and tracking numbers at tourist hotspots with technology. Tourism authorities are trying to have their cake and eat it, making tourists feel welcome, protecting locals and natural environments. The goal? Curbing the worst of tourism. The recovery after the pandemic has been a lot quicker than was anticipated and we seem to have forgotten some of those objectives of trying to do better uh, making sure we don't move into the traps that we saw before COVID um, hit us globally. Um, and some of those anticipations and some of those expectations have seemed to be, uh, um, or have gone out the door. Tourism numbers may be up, but the mood of local communities is less so as impacts bite. Japan is on the short list for many people now. And a lot of people are now searching for destinations that are not widely known. In the perfect world, it is best to have a sustainability policy in place where management is taking place to control um, not only the number of visitors, but also telling them the code of conduct and spending more time on the management like to, to measure and is it really happening on the ground rather than spending on the promotion because a lot of the destinations are still have the huge budget for promotion but when they do come they play like as if they are not responsible for creating themselves a destination for over tourism a small green corner in the foothills of the Indian Himalayas also faced the challenge of managing over tourism head on See, Corbett is one of the oldest parks of India. It was one of the first tiger reserves in India in 1973. So definitely the tourism model in Corbett was counterproductive to uh, wildlife. For decades, Corbett National Park has juggled the benefits of a growing tourism industry with protecting India's rich but fragile biodiversity. A lot of other parks have to learn from it that if you don't control, if you don't have a landscape level conservation strategy, if you just keep thinking about uh, the core and tourism as two separate things, then things will, um, you know, go haywire. <laughs> Hunter turned conservationist Dilip Katao was dedicated to striking a balance between revenue and responsibility. <laughs> He and his wife, Rina, developed Infinity Resorts, some of the first eco-conscious hotels in India, including one on the periphery of Corbett. At the same time, founding an NGO. One of its key focus areas, improving the lives of thousands of villagers living in and around the national park. What really was so important to him about wildlife was he grew up around it and it was something that um, 
kind of made his childhood what it was, right? And when he went out, he was an industrialist, as you know, set up lots of businesses and companies. And he came back to India and he realized that seas of forest with little pockets of humanity had changed into seas of humanity with little pockets of forest. And I think that's where he realized he had to conserve what was left. And what was left included a species on the brink of extinction. Corbett is home to 90% of the last remaining wild tigers on the planet. It hasn't escaped the impact of India's population density. The so-called buffer zone is also home to a growing number of villagers dependent on the park for basic needs. And tourism is never far. Earlier, we had a very wildlife-focused clientele, and lately it's been more towards, you know, the burgeoning middle class, and uh, lots of domestic tourism has now become the forefront of the, 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 the customer base that we cater to. So this, of course, presents us with new challenges. Mm. Those challenges included an explosion in the number of tourists in the buffer zone, and along with them, noise and traffic. But Corbett is not alone. Tiger, 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 tiger. Demand for the wild tiger experience across India's 53 tiger parks is seeing a resurgence post-pandemic. The tourism industry around these, the core of some of these tiger reserves, have several hotels and there are hundreds of thousands of people coming in every year, especially in the non-monsoon seasons, the prime season being the winters. But there is pretty much a good crowd coming all throughout the year from October to June end. And in the past, we would have a lull, but lately we don't see. So you have to book your safari is at least two months in advance to get the desired route that you want to go on. For Dilip Katow, change meant advocating a model of ecotourism that has gone beyond just the chance to spot the world's last tigers. In 1995, he introduced a scheme that gave financial assistance to villagers whose cattle had been killed by a tiger or leopard in the buffer zone. It's a hardship not without dire repercussions across India's national parks, with impacted villagers taking revenge. Even as he battled ill health, Dilip continued to defend the merits of supporting villagers with little choice but to live with wildlife. This has resulted in no poisoning or killing or poaching of tigers or leopards in the Corbett landscape and the number of tigers has increased. It offers a vision of a hopeful future where humans and nature might live in harmony. Without tourism, you will not have the kind of money that is going into the villages which are around these parks. Um, and without that kind of income of people, it is very difficult to justify to the poorest of the poor who live just at, along the periphery of the core of the tiger reserve that there will be tigers that will come and attack their livestock. There will be elephants that will raid their crops. It is an industry that is actually a magic wand for or many of these uh, communities who are paying the opportunity cost of conservation. To have a guest that comes down asking you, hey, what are you doing for the environment? What are you doing for Corbett National Park? I think that would have been his hope, that everyone comes down knowing that they are going to be contributing something back to visit a national park. Dilip Katow died before the term sustainable tourism became fashionable. But his idea of conscious travel in an area as ecologically fragile as Corbett aspired to similar goals. As the forces of rising travel demand and climate change begin to converge, experts are saying that it's becoming even more critical that we tread lightly. In the second part of our special, we explore why sustainable travel is poised to become the future of tourism. Dawn Tan, CNA.